Fuck. I did it again. What? <laughs> I pulled another Michael Wilson. Fuck. What? I didn't even hit the goddamn button. You weren't recording it. See that? <laughs> I didn't hit the damn button. <laughs> you need to get one of those that automatically starts recording as soon as it uh, picks up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I hit it. All right. Can I really go whenever I'm ready? Mm hmm. All right. He-Man's twin sister and defender of the Crystal Castle. This is Spirit, my beloved steed. Fabulous secrets were revealed to me the day I held aloft my sword and said, For the honor of Grayskull! Few others share this secret. Among them are Light Hope, Madam Raz, and Cowl. Together, we and my friends of the Great Rebellion strive to free Etheria from the evil forces of Horda. Hello, this is Optimus Solo, and welcome to the 68th chapter in our Powers of Grayskull series. With me for this journey, as he has been for the previous 67 chapters, is TFG1 Mike. Hello. This is 68.5, folks. The original <laughs> 68 did not uh, did not survive the cutting room floor. <laughs> we were only 10 seconds in. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, we, yeah. We, we've all, we, we've both been at 68 straight episodes. Neither one of us has missed for any reason, sickness, emergency, nothing. It's been the two of us together, 68 episodes in a row. Unlike him, where he chickened out on Mask at 14 podcasts. That's all I could take of that show. So that has to say something of the Masters of the Universe franchise, that at least I'm still going strong. You know, I, I said this in, in take one for this thing. I said, um, I think we ought to change the format of the show and go to two cartoons per podcast. That way it would last till 150 episodes because two cartoons is a hell of a lot easier than three. Hey, I remember once upon a time where we were talking about doing four or five in one episode. No. So I'm, no. I'm, I've always been... I, well, I, th I think the thing is, is I've been doing the... The Phineas and Ferb show with Peacock and Crump Michael. And we generally do those one full 30-minute, 23-minute cartoon episode per podcast, which has two 11-minute cartoons in it. Right. So I'm so used to doing that. <laughs> well, luckily, and, you'll get a little bit more of that as we move forward. But in this episode, like you said, we're only going to be talking about two episodes, the final two of season one of she or Princess of Power. We have episode 64, Wild Child. And episode 65, The Greatest Magic. Now, I know last episode we kind of teased a little bit about doing the season one recap. And for those that have been going with us for the last 68 episodes, you're probably thinking we're going to give you a lot of bunch of numbers and statistics and trivia and favorites and least favorites. But we're actually, we decided we're going to hold off on that a little bit. And the reason being is because season two of Shira is not necessarily that long. So. 20 28 cartoons. Right. So since it's only 28 cartoons and we're going to be covering it fairly uh, quickly, I think it's, uh, what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Uh, there's 11 podcasts that we'll be using on po in uh, Season 2. So instead of having a Season 1 breakdown and then like immediately doing a series breakdown, we're going to save that until the end mm -hmm. since we're only going to be doing 11 more podcasts. So we'll hold off on that. We will give some general thoughts on season one, but we're mainly going to be focusing on the greatest magic and wild child. Mike, are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready to close the, the I, chapter? I don't know if I'm willing. I'm, I'm ready, but I don't know if I'm willing. I feel like I'm, you know, a hostage here at this point because <laughs> it just seems like, and I know we'll get into this when we talk about the two episodes, but 
I understand. This was the 80s, folks. The 80s has nothing to do with serialization of, of cartoons. It's all one-shot stories, one-episode story. Like, there's no con- there's continuity in, in He-Man and She-Ra, but it's not, like, it's not like, say, Justice League or Batman the Animated Series or Batman Beyond, where it's got an overall arcing continuity. And it just seems like, and like I said, we'll get into this further when we talk about the two episodes... The way I felt about the ending of the season, oh, just as a season ender, like not even teasing anything, sadly anticlimactic. I got to steal a line from the Joker from from uh, Batman Beyond. It just felt like it. I like the episodes. It just, I don't know. I'm so I, used. To, I'm so used to television or cartoons nowadays giving us something or ending something or giving us something to look forward to. And while these two episodes are great. Because I'm so used to that one format now, it's like going back to this, like, wait, what, that's how it ends? Well, I mean, I, I think there is something to say, though. There is a lost art of just being able to have an entertaining uh, episode or entertaining, you know, all-encompassing show that you don't have to watch anything before or after. You can just kind of pick up and say, watch an episode here, watch an episode there, and enjoy it for what it is. I think it's, I think it's almost a lost art. I mean, I, I get it. And I'm a big continuity fan. I like how everything runs together and, and ties in together. And don't get me wrong, everybody knows that that's been listening to the last 67 episodes. But there is something to say for a certain audience or a certain demographic that just wants to be able to pop an episode and watch it and be done with it. Um, that's true for the other 63 episodes. <laughs> The other, well, even, even like the 65th episode, the ending of season one, I was expecting, even without looking at the episode name or whatever, I was expecting some sort of big finale leading into season two. Because the only reason why I'm saying that is because we now live in an age where cartoons and television do that kind of stuff. Right. And obviously back then they didn't. Right. And it's a little it's a little jarring. It doesn't take away my enjoyment from either one of the episodes, but I have a feeling well, we're gonna disagree on at least one of these episodes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can already tell you right now. There's one where I don't have any whispering wood woods moments. Oh, Lord. So we're ready and we hope you guys are ready, because it's time once again to go back to Ethereum. That your garden is a mess. Listen, Cowl, I know, and you know how much you like fresh vegetables, but why did you have to mess up my prize winners? <laughs> oh, you've been out in the sun too much, Bo. I haven't been near your prize losers. Why, you feather brain! Wait, Bo, Cowl's right. Something else has ruined your vegetables. Cowl could never wilt leaves like this. But what could have done it? I don't know. Quiet tonight. Don't complain. When it comes to garden, the rebel camp, no noise is good noise. What's that? Where? What? Right there, look. Ghosts! There is no such thing, is there? White ghosts? Did you say white ghosts? Uh, well, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Where did you see these ghosts? Right there. All right. Let's check it out. This vegetation is just like Bo's garden. Uh, look, what's this? It's the crest of the Green Island Kingdom. Doesn't make sense. The Green Islands are hundreds of miles away, and no one from there has ever even visited Whispering Woods. But there's no doubt that that's where the locket came from. No doubt at all. There's only one way to find out what's going on. Madam Raz, can you take the locket to Green Islands? King Arbor will have an explanation. On my way! <laughs> to the Green Islands, broom! Oh, dearie, Ma, you know where they are, don't you? Of course! 
in a North Growling Sea. No, the South Growling Sea. It's the North. They get the direction worked out before they accidentally fly into the fright zone. Oh, they'll be okay. But I can't stand around waiting for them to get back. Keep an eye on things here in camp. I'm gonna have a look around these woods. Yeah, I do know that. I think it's counting. Three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, go. Eight, nine, shut up. Go. Okay. First up today, like we said, is episode 64. It's the wild child. Dun, dun, dun. Do, 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 wild. No, I'm sorry, that's something different. Um, that was an air date of Wednesday, December 4th, 1985, written by Don Heckman, who we've seen before. Plot synopsis, something is wrong with the plants and vegetables of the Whispering Woods. Several of the rebels and woodsmen blame a pack of, quote, white fangs led by a mysterious white ghost that has been roaming the area. It's up to Shira to figure out who is responsible for these white ghosts and white fangs, and what is killing the vegetation of the Whispering Woods? All right. Something killed your microphone just then. Yes, uh, apparently I have my own black fang that was not enjoying the conversation. So, uh -huh. um, anyways, we have she. See. We have Shira, Mermista, Bo, Glimmer, Metamras, Cowl, and Broom. And a bunch of woodsmen, rebels, yan, villagers, etc., along with Princess Allegra and King Arbor. So, yes, his fucking name is King Arbor. Um, what are your thoughts, sir, of the wild child plot here about ghosts and white whispering woods and fangs and people? Can we go to another generation for a moment? Because as soon as I heard the name Princess Allegra, <laughs> I'm like, Where's Basso Profundo and what you know? It's like um, you know that that blaster episode from from Transformers where they have the the musical harmony. Oh, yeah. I thought you were gonna go to Allegra's window on Nickelodeon. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Uh, Carnage in C minor. That's what it is. <laughs> Love that episode. I don't care what anybody says. Oh lord. <laughs> That's a fun episode. Anyway. So much for the comment. No! You'll stay in the city! Try and stop me! Allegra! Where are you going? To my retreat! This was okay. The princess wasn't as annoying as 90% of the other kids. She was annoying, but she wasn't, like, so annoying that I wrote down 20 different notes of Shut the hell up. Hmm. Um... I like the plot overall for the most part. Essentially, it's just a a gardening plot. It's a it's a the whole episode is a natural disaster essentially. Yeah, I mean you could say that. I I okay, this is one of those plots that I was actually intrigued by because we are talking about ghosts possibly or some type of mystery, some type of mysterious figure, some type of uh, problem or dilemma that's going to have to be solved that's not just here's the device that's causing this, or here's, you know, a, a foe to fight. It's, there's something weird going on, and we have to use our brains and try to figure out a mystery. So that part of the plot, I am intrigued by. Um, unfortunately, that's not the episode we get, so... <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I'm a fan of the setup to the plot, and that's it. But yeah, the execution, honestly, sucks. <laughs> Well, let's get into how much it sucks. Let's let's just get right to it. Let's take a break. Let's come back, and we'll talk Whispering Woods, if there's any, Fright Zone, if there is not too much to, to bore everybody with. And, uh, well, there's a lot. There's a lot. And uh, we'll get into why this episode doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Just plain sucks. Dean's quiet enough. What's that? They sure look like white ghosts. But I don't believe in ghosts. Time for Shira. For the honor of Greyskull. A 
way to get a headache. All right, we're back. And if you are one that is looking for positivity in your life and looking to uh, hear good things about She-Ra and the Princess of Power, you might want to skip ahead a little bit because I think it's about to get downright nasty. Um, <laughs> let's take a brief trip to Whispering Woods just to see if there are anybody, uh, if, if there is anybody still looking for any live vegetation or plant life in the Whispering Woods. So, mm -hmm. Mr. TFG and Mike, do you have anything good to say about Wild Child? Madam Razin Broom for the win. I love, they're like an old married couple. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. I love the two of them. That's, that's the, that's one of the two things that saved this episode from being a zero folks. Um, but yeah, Madam Razin Broom, I love the, the, the looks that she gives Broom when he's interrupting her, <laughs> trying to help her to make sure she remembers the story. Right. And then she just throws her hands up at him. It's like, Oh my God. That, yeah, that, that that is so my mom to my dad. I <laughs> and what was God. the other? The other. All right, get ready, because I'm going to break everyone's brain, including Kevin's. I'm ready. The second best part of this episode is Bo. What? I, yep. I found Bo <laughs> to be not as annoying as he usually is. Granted, he only has two or three lines here, but... He wasn't his annoying self uh, for the most part. And compared to the rest of the episode, he is the lesser of the two saving graces here. Obviously, for me, Madam Raz and Broom are the best. But, yeah, Bo uh, pretty much um, saved this episode from being a zero. Wow. Okay. Um, well, I... I, I... You're reading my notes again, so I'd like you to stop. <laughs> um, so please, please knock that off because my first note uh, is that uh, Madame Raz and Broom. Um, I was right with you on that one. I was very happy to see them and to kind of get their interactions, and that was good. Like I said before, I did like the setup of like this whole ghost story, mysterious angle. Like I, I like that on paper. Um, mm -hmm. So that is a positive. Uh, outside of that. Mermista is here, so I enjoy when she's there, I guess. But, uh, well, and also she's there, and it makes sense because they're dealing with some water, you know, things right. and whatever. So it, it doesn't seem like it's forced in there. So I do like that. I'll get a little bit more into that later. But I do like that she makes an appearance. And I will say that they do do a decent job of having a cliffhanger in the episode break with Princess Allegra. Like, it, it was like a moment that seemed like a good time to take a commercial and leave the kids wondering about what would happen next. Outside of that, the Whispering Woods is is just a ghost town. It, it, it all the vegetation is dead. Yes, uh, it's living up to the premise. So let's just mosey on over to the fright zone. Really, seriously, we might as well find another place because the fucking fright zone is closed at this point. <laughs> no, no horde members at all. They don't. You know, you 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 kept saying that you enjoy the ghost aspect, the mystery aspect. We never even find out who the fuck the ghost was. At all, like, it wasn't her. Right. She said it wasn't her. So, who the hell was that? Like, are, are the White Fangs supposed to be the ghost? I I don't know. That, well, that I think was... it was that she was able to do that, and then she was able to make herself appear. I don't know how. See, I, yeah... Yeah, Don Heckman, go somewhere else. Don't write any more cartoons. Okay, so Shira, she uses sword to rope twice to rope the rock. It's then shown as she's dragging it through the sky while riding Swiftwind, and then two seconds later, she swings it above her head. What the hell? There's no way she would have fallen off that damn unicorn. She's that strong. She I, I don't care if she's the strongest woman in the universe. There is just the the, the logistics is just yeah. And I already mentioned no horde, no real action. Because really, seriously, like I said, this is a natural disaster episode. She she spends all her time throwing rocks into mountains and doing flybys of the ocean so the waves can get into the thing to stop the volcano, which is actually the the, the they made an a natural disaster the villain. Is this is this a Michael Bay episode in disguise? Seriously? Do we have to drill eight hundred feet over here? I mean, come on, give me a break. 
And the science of all this shit is just so bad. Don't get me started on the science. Um, and the, the only problem I have with the kid, this is my last one, the only problem I have with the kid, I had no problem with the princess up until the very end when she starts speaking in tongues or whatever the hell language. I'm like, wait, is this... Are we in some Iraqi jihad camp or something? What the hell is this shit? You just went there. Yeah, I had to. (laughs) Anything else? No, that's it. What do you got? Okay. Let me catch my breath. (laughs) All right. First of all, why does Bo have a garden? I would like to know this. I would like an answer, Don Heckman. Why did you write in there that Bo has a garden? He's been emasculated enough. Stop with this nonsense. Why is that fucking Glimmer or fucking Madame Raz or Cowl or anybody else but Bo? Um, where in God's green earth has Madame Raz and Broom and the Twiggit Spriggit whatever the fuck you call them, where have they been? Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Like, we have not seen hide nor hair except for little, you know, like, cameos or little background supporting characters. There's been nothing about these characters, and it's, it's been sorely missed. And I didn't realize it until I saw them together and was like, wait, I remember this was a fun part of the series that we've been missing for a long time, it seems like. So... I don't understand where they've been. I mean, it was good that they were here because it's the only good thing about this episode. Mm -hmm. Those woodmen, woodsmen, man, they are some stereotypes there. (laughs) Like, they are not PC. Like, the way they talk, the accents that are used on them, the intelligence level, I don't know. I don't know if that would fly these days. Um... Does Mermista have a different voice every time we see her? I haven't even... We haven't seen her enough for me to really notice. I don't know. It's an absolute terrible accent in this video, in this episode. Like, it is awful. I could hardly stand listening to her, and I'm starting to, to hope that we don't get to see more of Mermista, and I thought that was going to be one of my favorite characters. Allegra's voice is also terrible. It's I would awful. rather listen to the Allegra from the Transformers. At least that would rhyme. It was such an. It was. Su- it had the potential to be a cool character, and it's performed so poorly that it's just. It just ruins it for me big time. And mm-hmm. the voice on the White Fang is the worst voice work I've ever heard for an animal. Yeah. That is, maybe I'm just spoiled by Frank Welker and uh, D. Please tell me that was not Frank. No, God, no. That... D. Bradley Baker and some of these guys that can do animals. That yeah. was clearly just a voice actor trying to impersonate an animal that had no idea what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's not go too far into this whole volcano thing. I, what the <laughs> fuck? Throwing rocks into it is going to put it out. That's not how it works. That does not no and you don't get to just throw some water on it to cool down a volcano and where the fuck did the volcano storyline come from i don't know i thought they were gonna dig down and find somebody they were gonna find like a a machine or some piping or like a a underground creature or some shit they found a fucking she's digging with some weird i guess she carved out a piece of land and is digging, and all of a sudden there's just fucking fire. You, you've seen, I, I, I'm pretty sure you've seen or you know about Batman's giant penny in the Batcave from from Two-Face? Yeah. Okay. That's essentially what she fucking has. She has a fucking giant dime, and that's, like, she dug that out of the ground, and now she's using, she's trying to use, oh my god. Well, we, have this, we have this somewhat decent setup. Like, we have this idea that there's this mysterious, something's causing death and destruction to the plant life, vegetation, whatever, we'll go there. And then we have these white fangs, and we got this, you know, princess, long lost, whatever, that has something to do with it. Like, I'm digging it as far as, like, the plot part goes. And then we're going to go into the fact that it's a volcano causing it all. Then yeah. we're going to get into this stupid, stupid Masters of the Universe physics 
where we throw rocks at things and do things with waves and wind and, and whatnot to make this somehow work. It was way too fucking convenient of a solution. And then it's just when, like, the, the, hey, there's this huge volcano. We're going to throw some rocks on it, and that's going to solve everything. So this aired Wednesday, December 4th, 1985, five years before Earth, fire, wind, water, and heart. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet. Essentially, this was a precursor to Captain Planet, for crap's sake. And it's not just that, though. It's it, I don't know. There's so many things. Like, the animal language that she is talking to those animals with was invented in two seconds. Somebody spent... Yeah literally two seconds coming up with what that was going to be. It was like, hey, what would this animal language sound like? And the first idea that came into someone's head, and they just, like, spit it out, and that's what they used. That was not mm. thought out. It sounded like gibberish and stupid nonsense. Yeah. The only other cool thing, I don't know if it's cool or if it's good, but the only interesting thing I found was when she tried to use her mental powers. Right. And she says that they're too angry and it's blocking me. Her, don't, that, her interaction with the animals was decent. Yeah. I like her parts with the animals, but it's, and then they got to hit you over the head with it. The fucking king's name is King Arbor. Like fucking Arbor Day. Yeah. Are you kidding me? And Somebody goes to the tree. And she fucking abandons her animals immediately at the end. Mm -hmm. so she's been living to like protect these animals and secure them and this that and the other and she meets her dad who she's first of all it doesn't make sense because she's been separated from her dad for a long ass time right and her reasoning was that she had to protect these animals and that was her life now so clearly she doesn't give a fuck about her dad because she mm -hmm. could have returned at any time and now all of a sudden she's like oh but I do want him to know that I'm okay didn't they say it's been like five or seven years or something. It was something like she like went missing when she was like seven, and now she's twelve. Yeah. Like it, now, you want a, him to make sure that you're okay. He's just had five years of trauma, thinking you're dead, mm -hmm. and then so you clearly don't care. You don't make any attempt to to meet him, to give him a message or anything. And now at the end of the episode, he's like, "Hey, come home," and she's like, "Fuck you, animals! I'm out of here." Mm -hmm. This episode is garbage. It is. And the PSA is about vegetables being important, which makes me want to stab my own eyeballs out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, this right, this yeah. episode's awful. We need to take a break before I blow a gasket and, and recreate that volcano. So we're, we'll be right back with some hardware because I got something to hand out to a couple people. <laughs> I know that. Watch out! That does it! No more Mr. Nice Broom! From now on, I do the navigate! Do you have news, Madame Raz? Oh, dearie, I certainly do. The locket you found belonged to King Arbor's daughter, Princess Allegra. But how did it get here? Oh, wait! There's more! The princess disappeared five years ago. When she was seven! What? Oh, yeah, well, I thought you left. Oh, where was I? Oh, yeah, her sailboat hit a storm off the coast, and she was never heard from again. Her father's desperate to find her. He's already on his way here. Now, you listen to me, Broom. I've had enough of your interruptions. I just wanted to be sure you got the story straight. What? Deary, I always get my story straight. I don't get it. How could her locket get from the growling sea to Whispering Woods? Good question. Mimista knows what goes on in the ocean waters. Maybe she can help us. All right, our first out of two opportunities to hand hardware out. And I'm still trying to cool down over here, so I'm going to pass it over to Mike. <laughs> while you're, while you're uh, you know, having some AC poured all over you, okay, so... I need those waves that cool that volcano fucking down. I know, right? All right, so here's the thing. Everyone else, except for Madame Raz, Broom, and Bo, get a horde bat. Even I get a horde bat, the second horde bat I've gotten, because it's the second time out of 65 episodes or 64 episodes that I've noticed fucking Lukey. <laughs> he was so blatantly there because he's in the scene where Adora goes to walk away from the scene to turn into she -Ra. And immediately I saw him, and I'm like, oh, my God, why is he holding a blue triangle? 
and then, I then go to the end of the episode and he unfolds it. It's his fucking tail. He's touching himself. He's masturbating in the background of this cartoon. Are you kidding me? Um, for Power Swords, Madam Raz, Bo, and Broom. Absolutely. They were the saving graces for this episode. They're the only Those three characters are the only reason why this episode does not have a double zero. All right. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you've handed out some horde bats. Of course. I got to be a little more specific with mine. Mm-hmm. I got to take one and uh, shove it up his ass sideways. Don Heckman, yep. get away from my cartoons. Yep. Get the fuck away from my cartoons. This is yep. absolute ass nine writing. And you had a decent premise and you just fucked it up beyond belief. Um, mm-hmm. And the whole volcano angle is so absolutely fucking stupid that it ruins any chance that this episode would be decent with she interacting with these wolves or whatever you want to call them with this mystery thing and something something that we don't know is causing some destruction and then it's a fucking volcano. Um, and that's just, I don't want to make it seem like that's the only thing that's making me shit on this episode. There's a billion things, which I outlined some of them, but I could have I could have written like 20 notes for Freight Zone. Yeah. All right, I'm also, and I hate to do this, but I also have to give a specific horde bat to Melanie Britt and Linda Gary. Okay. Because one of them uh, is voicing Allegra, that would be Linda Gary, mm-hmm. and Mel- Melanie Britt is voicing Mermista. And mm. the two voices for those characters, and I guarantee one of them, hope I don't know, it could have been Erica Scheimer, I guess, but it's most likely one of the other two is doing the voice for that animal thing. Um, mm. the voice work is awful and even if the writing had been good I couldn't have scored this episode uh, positively because of the voice work it is awful 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 and then whoever invented that animal language whoever you are mystery person hopefully it's one of the people I'm already giving a horde bat to because you should get one too it's probably Heckman he probably okay. wrote it in there and created it himself absolutely asinine so that's it there's no power swords I can't give one out even if I liked Madam Raz and Broom, I, this episode does not deserve I, power swords. Protection swords. I, I, I generally agree, but I'm sorry. The argument, the, two, the, the back and forth that the two of them have, I have to give them power swords because they're the only saving grace for me for this episode. We keep giving people power swords. We're supposed to be giving people protection swords. Whatever. <laughs> All right. This thing, just one has a jewel in the hilt. Well, one turns into a lot of things. And in this episode, yeah. it should have turned into a match to burn the script away. Um, what is mm. your Crystal Castle rating for this episode? One and a half. One and a half? Yep. I was wrong with my prediction of your score. I thought you, I thought you were going to be even with me. I thought we were on the same page. This gets a half Crystal Castle oh, for me. Okay. It gets a half. I am so close to giving this episode a fucking zero, except I <laughs> like She-Ra's interaction with the wolves, and I like Madame Raz and Broom. Otherwise, this is one of the worst episodes we've seen. And it's the second to last episode of season one, and it's so disappointing. This is why I said at the very beginning of the podcast, it's kind of sadly anticlimactic. Well, regardless if it's continuity or not, it's still very anticlimactic. Let's hope uh, the final episode is better. I'm about to show everybody how bipolar I can be. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure trading magics with you, dearie. Yeah, we make a great team, Madam Raz. Yeah, goodbye, everyone. Thanks. I really had a good time. Uh oh, what's that? Um, Orko, do you have anything to do with that? I sure don't. In that case, for the honor of Grace I'll try to stop this thing. Oh no, it's not after me, it's after Orko. Kira! <laughs> Hang on! Jump 
and jiggleberries. Who are you and where's my nephew? Uncle Martoy! Uncle, my boy! Gee, Unc, uh, was that your spell that brought us here? Oh, that it was, though I didn't mean for it to bring anyone else. Uh, by the way, uh, who is your lovely friend? Oh, come on, I'll introduce you. Uh, she uh, this is my Uncle Montour. A pleasure, my dear. Welcome to Trolla. Oh, uh, thank you. It's nice to meet you. But could you tell me what I'm doing here? Yeah, what are we doing here? Oh, there's big trouble, Orko. The Crimson Council has disappeared. The second and last episode up today is episode 65, the last one of season one, and it's all about the greatest magic. Air date Thursday, December 5th, 1985. Written by Larry DeTilio. While Finally, a good writer. While visiting the Great Rebellion, Orko is summoned back to Trala, along with, accidentally, she -Ra. There, Uncle Montork, Driel, and the rest of the Trollan people need their help after the disappearance and the kidnapping of the Crimson Council. We have She-Ra, Madame Raz, Driel, Orko, and Uncle Montork. Mm -hmm. And then we have, get ready for this, Fuzabella the Muckus, Dr. Zug, Blim the High Muckmuck, -muck, A Face with a Ramp, Big Uggo, Warden Umpty, and some various other trollins, including okay, the Crimson first, Council. First of all, before we get into general things here, the face with a ramp. I believe that was a his tongue coming out of his eyeballs because <laughs> no, I'm serious, because I swear as they were running up the thing, it it sounded like this, like he was really in pain. He couldn't talk <laughs> properly because someone was stepping on his tongue. I, I gotta get to I gotta know though, Mike. Uh, we've had a lot of different crossover episodes. We've seen He-Man. We've seen Skeletor. You know, we've we've seen all this. Uh, you know, He-Man and She-Ra together, Skeletor and Hordak together. Were you expecting, or what's your take on a crossover episode? Not, I'm not talking about getting into the actual nuts and bolts of whether you liked the episode or not. But mm -hmm. what's your thoughts of a She-Ra episode where it's a complete crossover just with Trala? I like it. I think it's cool. I think it's interesting. I think it's fun. Uh, I had a hell of a lot more fun watching this than I did the previous episode. Um, do Orko and Madame Raz actually have like a character in her? Like, I, yeah, I know, at the I know very it's beginning, dope. they're training magic. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a scene with the whole Rebe rebellion and Madame Raz and Orko, and Orko says, "Thanks for trading magic with me," or whatever. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like I've been wondering for the past sixty-four episodes. I, I know that originally. When I listened to the commentary on some of the DVD versions of the, of Secret of the Sword, that that Larry Dottilio has said that uh, they wanted to make a female version of Orko, but not really have Orko there. Hence, why that's Madame Raz, and she's essentially the absent-minded witch Hazel kind of character. And uh, I always wondered if they were going to team up, and that's one of the reasons why I love this one is because it's a very brief team up between Madame Raz and Orko. I think that's very cool. The other thing this episode and a few of the episodes previous have started to do is it we've got a shift away in the series from it being more of a unique experience or a extreme situation that causes these worlds to interact or or people to move from one world to the other, and it seems like. In recent times, it's it's shifted to something that's done very frequently and without much thought. You know what I mean? Like, they can just kind of go from Etheria to Eternia and back and forth whenever they want to these days. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it just definitely seems like before, like when the, when we started with She-Ra, it was more of a, uh, the sorcerers had to open a portal or something that you know, dire straits had to be going on to, to do this. And, right. and, and now it seems like it's much more like Orko's just kind of going to, to do some magic with uh, Madame Raz and, and He-Man and She-Ra are going, bouncing back and forth because, you know, just based on the last few crossovers, which is an interesting yeah. transition, I guess. Well, I think the thing here is they've also, they, they stated this a couple of times uh, recently in the last, I'd say, 10 episodes of the series here between 55 and 65 of the cartoons that it's no longer the sorceress dealing with it it's light hope dealing with right. it and sometimes they don't even explain it at all the thing here with um with montork 
he opened the portal himself. Right. So he was trying to grab Orko. And no, but I'm saying about how, how yeah. Orko was there to begin with. Oh, um... You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's very much... Because we don't actually see him travel from Eternia to Etheria. Yeah. Um, so it just must be that they're just able to do this free willingly. I guess. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's an interesting thing, because you wouldn't think... Uh, you know, if Shira's going to interact with somebody from Eternia, you think it's going to be He-Man or Adam, maybe the Sorceress, and maybe Skeletor and Hordak are going to interact, but you you would never think that it's going to be Orko without those other people. So I think that's a very interesting dynamic they set up for this episode. The one thing, uh, maybe I should say this for the end, but the one thing I'll say for this entire first season that I was, re- outside of Secret of the Sword, that I was really disappointed with, not enough Cringer. I mean, I get it that, you know, he can't always be there, but a lot of the crossovers did. I think I've seen Cringer once this entire series with the crossovers. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll come back, make our second and only other trip to the Whispering Woods and Fright Zone and see if we can manage to stay in the Whispering Woods a little bit longer than last. <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> Jiggleberries. Who are you and where's my nephew? Uncle Montoy. Orko, my boy. <laughs> Gee, Unc, hey, was that your spell that brought us here? Oh, that it was, though I didn't mean for it to bring anyone else. And by the way, uh, who is your lovely friend? Oh, come on, I'll introduce you. Ashira? This is my uncle, Montoy. A pleasure, my dear. Welcome to Trolla. Uh, thank you. It's nice to meet you. But could you tell me what I'm doing here? Yeah, what are we doing here? Oh, there's big trouble, Orko. The Crimson Council has disappeared. Hop and hoobies. That's trouble. We need your magic badly, but I can send you back, Shira. No reason for you to get involved. Orko is my friend. I'll stay. Aw, oh, thanks, Shira. Orko? Triel! <laughs> hey, what's the matter? Aren't you glad to see me? Who is that? that that's Shira. You never hurt me like that. Ah. Uh, I gotta go. I guess we'll talk about this later. Oh, no, you don't, Mr. Orko the Great. You're not going anywhere without me. Especially with her. Well, fine with me. Where to, Unc? All right, so we find ourselves back in the Whispering Woods, hopefully for a little bit longer than we were with last episode's visit. And, Mike, what did you like about the greatest magic? Everything about this episode was just fun. The whole thing with Trala, Montork pulling them through. Um, I thought that was very fun. Starting off with Orko at the rebel camp and doing training with Madame Raz, that was fun. Um, uh, you know, something we've very rarely gotten He Man. Like, I can remember maybe one or two times we ever really went to Trala, and it wasn't as fun as this i don't know if it's because of the series change because from he-man to she-ra like it wasn't as dire but you know we get driel we get orko we get montork we get we even get troll and villains like i never expected in either show to ever see troll and villains i mean i i really don't we, we've been doing this podcast so long folks i really don't remember the villains from the original he-man troll and episodes so if anyone wants to comment on the post and let me know um but yeah, we get two kind of cool troll and villains here. I love that. And honestly, because of outside of Madame Raz, Broom, and Bo, the shitstorm that was the previous episode, I just started having fun with this. I love everything about this episode, so I just didn't even take any more notes other than those two. I mean, I just it's just so fun, refreshing, interesting. Um, you know, you got the you know you got the Crimson Council, you got the the guard who's trapped in the jail. And you got these two trollin' villains who put the whole Masters of the Universe thing, you know, uh, magic versus technology to, to 
you know, we, we get back to that. We haven't had that a lot. We, you know, I mean, technically we've had it throughout Shiro with, with Whispering Woods and all the rebels being mad, not all the rebels being magical, but you know what I mean? And then Hordak having the technology, but it's been a while since that kind of plot was front and center. The only thing I'll say um, about these final two episodes, and maybe I should say this fan, but I just can't. I, I, my brain's all over the place. So, only thing I didn't really like outside of all the shit we didn't like about the last episode, there's no horde in either one of these. Which is, I mean, it's fine, but I don't know. It just seemed kind of off. Yeah. What do you like about this one? Well, first of all, I mean, random Madame Raz and Orko trading magic just to start the episode. Mm-hmm. You're just like, what? Yeah, I'm intrigued yeah. immediately. Like, that's the first scene, and you're just like, what's going on here? Um, yeah, what the hell? Orko knows everybody's secrets. Not just He-Man, he knows she secret as well. Because she transforms directly in front of him. So... Yeah, okay, yeah. And and the other thing I want to point out, when I mentioned about noticing Luki in the last one... She runs right by him and transforms. So essentially, he's hiding right there, and even he knows the, mm. the the secret. So the whole thing with only three people: Madame Raz, Broom, or Madame Raz. Who the hell is the other one? Cowl and Madame Raz, Cowl, and Light Hope are the only three. Yeah, no, Orko knows. <laughs> Luki knows. But Orko might be one of the only ones that knows both He Man and Shira's right. secret identity. Yeah. So, um, okay, in twenty two minutes or whatever this tagged in on um uh, granted we already know driel and we already know uncle montork and orko but in in 22 minutes detilio is able to give us like six characters that are well developed and interesting like fuzabella and blim are great together like the two the the muck muck and the muck s like they their interaction is fantastic. It's like something it is. it's like something out of an old TV show that just doesn't done anymore. And then you, you know what it reminded me of? Mm-hmm. It reminded me of if um Mad Madam Mim and Merlin were actually married and not yeah. villains of each other. Like it really reminded me of the Sword in the Stone from Disney. Absolutely. Um but the, the <laughs> warden guy was cool in his couple seconds. The council guy was cool in his last little couple seconds. The villains, Dr. Zug and Big Uggo. Like, they were fantastic. Like, every character in here seemed like, hey, I would like to know more about, can we have an Orko series? Can we just have a Trala series? Like, Mm -hmm. I would have been down for that back in the day, because there's some cool characters here. Uh, And even some just fun moments for kids and stuff like that. The nose pulling on the face entrance by that machine. I mean, come on, you're expecting, uh, you know, if there's an entrance, you're expecting it to be like a structure, and, you know, you have to hit it with a ram or something to get in but no this thing's just like pulling on its nose making it red um what a great line that detilio puts in there from shira this thing has more arms than multibot yeah. like a perfect reference to something else that we would know and she would know from the series yeah. flotsam prison so close to Folsom prison Oh, yeah. That it was awesome the way they said that. There was a cool effect on the water going up to that to show the magical spell or whatever with, like, the... the it wasn't just, like, a glimmery, shiny water. It was, like, almost like a incandescent color effect to it. It's mm-hmm. kind of sparkling. I, I, I just like the villain here. Um, we finally get a decent use of Shira's power where she's not breaking the laws of physics. She's just pushing something real hard. Like, I get that maybe she shouldn't be able to move this whole thing, but she is supposed to be strong. But at least right. it's something you can buy. Like, she's literally just pushing something. Mm-hmm. She should have pushed a little bit more, though, because I think if it was completely off the radar, he would have never known it was still there. He would have just assumed that it was gone. I thought that's the angle they were going to go, where he's like, there's an explosion, there's smoke, and then it's just gone. Mm-hmm. But they didn't quite do that, because you could still see it in the radar. And he's like, wait a second. Um, and I actually, you wouldn't think I would do this, but I actually like the idea that they have the ability to work magic through loved ones. <laughs> like, I thought that was a cool touch. Like, yeah, it wasn't yeah, some well, cheesy, like, I'm going to have a one tear drop or love is going to fix the day. It's, I can channel because I'm on, I am connected to this person in, in a, in a magical way to begin with through love. I can connect with them and, and work my magic through them. It's not just everything was saved because of love. So <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. I only have one fry zone moment. Yeah, I only have one fry zone moment, too. What is your fry zone moment? Okay. Let's see here. 
didn't like Driel's jealousy at the beginning. I, but luckily, luckily, they didn't make it a huge issue. I didn't like it either, but it is so typical of women. No. Well, throughout the episode, both Orko and she say, my friend, my pal. But that is what... Well, that is how a woman's brain works. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I know. It is disturbing, but it is true. Um, but I, I, I'm glad that Dottilio dropped it immediately as soon as as soon as soon Driel says the line, okay, I'm not leaving you alone, especially with her. No, like, it was almost since... like Dottilio was like channeling something he experienced. Like his wife or somebody at one point was probably like said some okay. something about... Uh-huh. Yeah, whatever yeah, and he's just like i'm gonna put this in the hell we're talking about let's hope that never happened to you <laughs> but i'm just saying like i could just see that like he had, had one experience with a significant other that once was like who's this like give me a break mm-hmm. um my only fright zone moment is dr zoog is terrible with a joystick <laughs> he's like let me get the aim back and then he goes buy it and has to come back and misses it yep. again like he apparently has never played a video game um, and all I think of is um, Luke dodging Vader. The Force is strong with this one. And uh, I should have a Fright Zone moment as well for the PSA. Um, pet. I didn't watch it. About, the PSA was literally about pets and that they require a lot of care. Okay, now this would have... Okay, so the vegetable one does... The, the eating healthy one doesn't really fit either one of these episodes, but the pets one would have fit the last episode. We got two PSAs in a row about eating vegetables and taking care of your pets. Yeah. Shoot me now. Um, but overall, not too much negative to say about this episode. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back and have our final award ceremony for season one. Now then, what's been done about the council's disappearance? My students are out rounding up every wizard left on the planet. Hopefully we can keep Trolla's magic in balance until we find a council. Good. But how are you going to... Oh, galloping gazelles. <laughs> the alarm! Look out. Look out. It's coming. It's coming. Everybody up. Whoa! Help! Help! Oh, my grits and grappies. What is it? It's a machine, I think, and I don't like it. I don't think it likes us. Let's get it, Unc. Right. Maybe not with magic, but let's see how it deals with a little muscle. Oh, I say, bravo! Way to go, she Thank you! Don't mention it. <laughs> this thing doesn't know when to quit. All right, it's the last chance for season one to get a few more pieces of trophy and awards out of your trophy case. Mike, what do you got? Any horde bats or protection swords here? Swords for everybody. Sword for Larry, sword for Shira, sword for Orko, sword for Drea. Swords for everybody. Absolutely loved everything about this episode. Uh, it was a million times better than episode 64. It was fun. It was interesting. It was enlightening to see Troll and villains. I thought that was cool. So, yeah, our, uh, protection swords for everybody. I as, am, all, as always, am more specific than you. Um, I will give a protection sword out to Mr. Larry Dottilio, Orko, and then I'll be a hypocrite because I'm not going to be specific. I'll give a protection sword okay. out for all of Troll. Um, Thank you. So every gets a gets a protection. The whole of Trala gets a protection sword. So right down its equator, splitting the planet in half. Uh, no horde bats for me. Episode was no. too fun, too positive. Mister yep. TFG and Mike, your last rating of season one is five, and I will echo that five out of five. So we end on a positive note, even if it didn't give you the cliffhanger you were hoping for. At least it was a good freaking episode, and not like sixty four. Mm. Right. Yeah, let's never speak of Season 1, Episode 64 ever again. All right, we're going to take one final break. When we come back, we'll give you our thoughts 
in brief on season one and setting up the stage for the final run of She-Ra Princess of Power. Because the world needs another movie podcast. The Geek Cast Radio Network presents for your listening pleasure, The Cinema Geek. Hosted by Amanda, Kevin, Matt, and Dan. Each week we dive headfirst in the landscape of movies as we discuss movie news, play movie games, go in-depth on reviews, and even have a top ten countdown or two. Also, don't miss our director retrospective series where we review noted director's movies film by film. Bottom line is, if you love movies and love podcasts, you need to experience The Cinema Geeks. You can find us on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, or geekcastradio.com. It's Showtime Synergy. The latest review podcast from the Geekcast Radio Network is here. So join TFG1 Mike, Nicole Hailstorm, and myself, Lady Wreck, as we will be reviewing all 65 episodes of Joe and the Holograms in a 25-episode-long podcast. You can find Showtime Synergy on iTunes and geekcastradio.com. We are the truly outrageous podcast that you want to be listening to. All right, we're back to wrap up season one. We got to put a bow tie on it. We got to we got to send it off to sea, let it sail, and get ready for what is season two. So, what are your final <laughs> thoughts on season one? He said we got to put a bow tie on it. No, you leave bow and his ties alone. <laughs> There's yeah. no pun intended. Yeah, pun was very much intended on this end. Um, I. I don't speechless. Know. I I like season one. Okay, but there are only out. Uh, Secret of the Sword is separate. It it just fucking is. It's it's the way they presented that was a movie. The way I originally saw it was a movie. I know it's five separate episodes that they you know narrated and whatever else. But to me, that's that's the movie and that's separate. You know. That I will always watch when I want to watch He-Man and She-Ra together. Um, or when I want to watch He-Man and She-Ra do Star Wars. Um, <laughs> the rest of the season, there are probably... Out of the 60 episodes that are left, taking into account those five, not not counting in this, out of the 60 remaining episodes, there are probably 15 or 20 that I'll never watch again. Um, just because I don't care about them, just because that the villains or lack of villains just aren't in my wheelhouse, I can safely say I will never watch Wild Child ever again. <laughs> that is... I know we've given zeros to um, two episodes before that episode. The only reason why I will ever watch Wild Child ever again, and really I won't have to because I will have already grabbed the audio, is to hear Madame Raz and Broom argue with each other. That's the only good thing about that episode. Um, overall, season one was good. At least towards the end, they stopped somewhat emasculating the men. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I don't really think that the women in He-Man were treated too terribly. Because... I thought that was the whole thing, you know, why they wanted to create a, a female superhero for girls and everything else. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. But, like, I thought that was the whole point of them basically creating an all girl show, pretty much. And then, you know, the men end up, you know, as Hans and Franz would say, girly men, you know, because essentially that's what some of them turned into. Um, the disappointment for me on the season is. The final two episodes, while I love the greatest magic, or, yeah, yeah, that's what it's called. While I love the Tron episode, the final two episodes had nothing to do with the Horde. At all. Yeah. That's your main villain! Like, I get, like, if... He's still trying to get the flowers out of right Zone. He, he, that should have been the season finale. Switch the greatest magic with flowers for Hordak. That would have been the best season ending ever. <laughs> what about you? Um, I guess here's my take so far, and it's going to be, I guess, maybe a sneak peek to some of my thoughts on the overall series. Uh, it's been up and down. Like with He Man, it was more. Excitement, excitement, I like, I like, I like, and then, like, oh, this season is getting old, let's make it end, please. And then it would do it again, like, the next season or whatever. But this has been up and down and up and down, and it's like, 
here's four great episodes. Here's two shitty episodes. Here's three great episodes. Here's one shitty episode. Like, it just keeps going back and forth. But my biggest takeaway right now is I am struggling to find characters that I like in this. Outside of some of the side characters, like we have with, uh, you know, Broom and Madame Raz and, right. you know, Kyle, whoever it was, whichever one you gravitate towards. Like, right. like in the He-Man series, by now I had, like, I liked Stratos. I liked Zodak. I liked, you know, there was multiple people that I was like, oh, if this is an episode containing this character, I'm going to be excited. With right. this series, I'm not excited because it's going to have Glimmer. I'm not excited because it's going to have Mermista in it anymore. Or because it's going to have Queen Angela or even the villains, Catra, Scorpia, like, who am I supposed to be excited about? Yeah. So, I mean, it leaves it where it's like, well, I hope it's a crossover, because that seems to be the good episode. Yeah. Um, so, I'm a little disappointed. I thought I... I have fond memories of Mermista, of Frosta, and um, probably one or two other ones that we haven't seen yet. And so far, I've been disappointed with their... Uh, appearances in their, per, you know, Frost. I think it's more so just because she hasn't been in it, <laughs> outside of yeah. like little cameos. And Mermista, I'm just so thrown off by the the weird voices and stuff that's coming out of her. Yeah. And why can't there be a fucking Mermista and Merman episode? <laughs> like, just you give wish. me a water centric episode with those two involved. But here's my thoughts looking forward. Usually, I have not, like we've said many times, we have not seen. Uh, She-Ra, I have not seen any episodes of She-Ra basically since I was a kid. So yeah. I watched them growing up, and now this is my, you know, 20 years later self or whatever watching this. 30. Yeah, what, however old I am. And, uh, and basically, I don't know what's coming up. I don't know what season two and season three are going to hold. I know they're each short at seasons, like 14 episodes well, each. there's only season two. There is no season well, three. Well, I mean, technically some break it down into two seasons. But well, they're wrong. It, you know, there's only 28 episodes left, regardless. Yeah. Now, so I don't know a lot about what's going to come up, but normally, typically, what would happen in the 80s is you in the second season, or you know, whatever comes after the first season, however many seasons it is, you would have the introduction of new toys. So you would have to have episodes that were featuring these new characters, new toys, etc., to try to sell them. So I'm assuming we're still going to have four, five, six new characters that we're going to see because I know, like I said before, that there's toys that we haven't seen yet. So I'm assuming that they're season two characters. So at least maybe I will like some of them and then look forward to those episodes. I don't care if they're bad, good, or whatever. Just give me some characters that I can look forward to episodes that they're in. Because right yeah. now I'm more interested in like, hey, like that episode with, with uh, General Sunder was cool and that episode with that other bad horde character was cool like i'm more excited about these side one-off like minor characters than i am about it you know outside of modulock i guess has some cool episodes i don't know yeah i, I don't know either so i'm kind of like bummed at some of the episodes or some of the characters that i thought i was gonna like and i'm really searching for favorite characters that i haven't found yet and 65 episodes should be long enough to find them yeah i remember over the last four four years that we've been doing this whole thing that I remember when we were, when we were prepping for the she part of the show that I said to you that I had seen several season one episodes on Cubu right. or whatever it was. I, I saw them on TV and uh, they were only ever season one episodes. Like, so, I mean, I haven't like you, in 30 years, and I don't even remember... Outside of Secret of the Sword as a kid, I do not remember seeing any of these episodes as a kid. I know that for a fact. But, you know, when we were doing He-Man and stuff, you know, they would show some of the stuff on on this the, this this kid's channel here locally that, that I would catch every now and then. But most of it was reruns of, like, the Seahawk Returns <laughs> or you know, whatever else. So season two for me is completely fresh and completely new. Like, I have never, I do not remember any of this shit right. at all. Um, and for those of you that are that are looking forward to to more of our chapters of, gray, of uh, you know, Powers of Grayskull, of Grayskull et cetera, uh, it, we're going to wrap this up in a little bit different way because we have basically 
uh, 11 episodes left to, to go through Shira. And the first half are going to be just like we have been doing with three episodes a piece. And then those final mm-hmm. five episodes are just going to be two first, like we did today. Thank so we're going to have six episodes with three. And then we're going to have five episodes that just cover two a piece. So can we just record those six episodes in one whole week and be done? With <laughs> no, I wanted to. I want some more. Come on, in my life. I want some more Shira in my life. And that'll take us through episode 93 of Shira, Princess of Power, and the end of this journey. And then we, we're going to have some uh, some recaps, etc. But that's kind of what's what's looking what's to look forward to. So you have 11 more episodes proper. Of Shira, of Shira yes. episodes, and then, and then some special. And the stuff. next year we get to the blah, new adventures. I've never seen that, so that'll be a fun adventure. Okay, so uh, since we're talking about this, before I close the show, as a kid, and I think I've mentioned this in the last four years on this show, I thought Eternia was back. I thought the classic filmation was back in 1990, and as a ten-year-old in 1990 who had just started watching The Simpsons. Um, cause my mom let me watch anything I wanted, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, <laughs> radar movies, notwithstanding, you know, whatever. Um, I was excited to see the new adventures of He-Man and then I saw it and I'm like, where's Castle Grayskull? Where's Skeletor? Where's the real Skeletor? Where's, where's this? Where's that? So, yeah, I mean, I had seen several episodes of new adventures, but I do not remember that show for anything, <laughs> really. Um, and as I've said uh, before, like before we started this run here at the end of the year of 2015, when I did the, the when we did the content update 03, that essentially what's going to happen next year is we're going to have two cycles. We're going to have one cycle where we, we where we release the new adventures episodes, and then the end of the year. Uh, somewhere around, I think, September or October, or however many, 15 episode or 10 episode I don't even know how many it is. You know, by December 31st next year, this whole show will be done. So 27, December 2017, Powers of Grayskull will be completed. You're welcome, Tim Silvers. <laughs> he mentioned to me on Twitter a while ago, I don't know how you guys are going to get through all this. And I'm like, wait, you listening to it or us producing it? He's like, you producing it. I'm like, don't worry, there's a plan. Yeah, I mean, The New Adventures is only 25 episodes, and yeah. uh, the reboot is only 15. 15, yeah. So, it'll be fairly easy. We've tackled the, the big ones already. Thank God. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening to the Myths of Etheria. If you'd like to get in contact with us or leave feedback for the show, there are several ways to do so. Visit the website, geekcastradio.com, where you can comment on this and all of our other episode posts. Email us, feedback at geekcastradio.com. Put in the subject line, Myths of Etheria, episode number 68, or whatever number you're, 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 you're wanting to leave feedback for. There's almost a cheese it coming up there, folks. Uh, leave the show's feedback in iTunes, please do this. Follow us on Twitter, at Geekcast Radio is the network Twitter. You can follow at Pow of Grayskull for the show Twitter, minus TFG and Mike. What is your Twitter? Mine is at Optimus Solo, and if you're listening, tweet me. Darn it. I want to know who these silent listeners are. Tweet me. Yeah. Uh, become a fan on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash geekcast radio network. We hope you enjoyed the myths today, and don't forget to join us in our next adventure when we will take a look at the final... That isn't right. <laughs> first three episodes of season two. Episode 66, one to count on. Episode 67, the return of the general. Hey, is that the, the General Sunder dude? <laughs> Um, and episode 68, Out of the Cocoon. Oh no, butterflies. Yay. For now, I am TFU and Mike with... The one and only Optimus Solo. By the power and for the honor of Grayskull, you all have the power. Dun, dun, dun. I'm not